have to turn on. There it is. Sorry, guys. Up there. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for music. What a wonderful gift. And for the most incredible gift of all. Salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that at this moment and at this time, your Holy Spirit remain with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so another year ends. Incredible as it may be, sad as it may be, happy as it may be for some. That's it. 2013 is done. Vanished. It is being shredded as a pile of old calendar sheets. It is just a figment of our memories. One thing about calendars and about this time of year, especially in sports, is highlight reels. Yes? The other day um, I was... Um, surfing, browsing the web, and they had this really interesting highlight reel made of Peyton Manning's 51 touchdown passes. And, and it was basically, you know, all the pictures of him throwing 51 touchdown passes and breaking a record. Great highlight reel. And, and, and see, that's the thing about highlight reels. They're highlights. Because nobody shows all the picks that he's thrown. Nobody shows all the sacks that he's gotten. See, Tony Romo doesn't have a highlight reel. What? <laughs> highlight reels. And normally around this time of the year, we look at highlight reels, don't we? And, and all of us personally probably have highlight reels. I, I know that, that I, I have some very uh, memorable highlight reels of 2013. Um, obvious, probably the, the most memorable one of this year is, is the incredible blessing and privilege of um, being part of a Reformation tour, of, of seeing history not just be pages in a book, but alive. That was a highlight reel for us. Uh, and it's not just because, ooh, they got to go to Europe. No, it, was, it, it really was a very spiritual experience. Um, Teaching Bible, senior Bible, that was, that was a highlight. It was probably not a highlight for some of my students, but it was a highlight. Eight years of marriage with my beautiful wife. You're brave. <laughs> and you deserve a medal just for that. And a lot of us have highlight reels. Some of us got married this year. Some of us got pregnant this year. Some of us had kids this year. Some of us graduated from something, but graduated. <laughs> Some of us uh, got a new job. Some of us got a new relationship going on. Some of us, there's something positive that has been going on it this year, and, and we look back at our highlight reel, we will find positive things, things to get excited about. And as the 31st <coughs> this week will give way to the 1st, we will observe one of the oldest traditions that is known to American people and to mankind, probably, New Year's resolutions. Because that's what we do the 31st. We have strange traditions in Peru. You don't say. Um, one of the weirdest things that we do for New Year's is um, wear yellow underwear. <laughs> Don't ask me why I do not have a historical background on why my ancestors at some point decided to wear yellow underwear on New Year's Eve. There's the other one of eating 12 grapes. I don't know if that's done in America. Yeah, you eat, you know, 12 grapes, one with each of the strikes of midnight. Uh, another one is if you want to take a trip, you pack your suitcase and you walk around the block. That's... I've seen people do that, and I've always wondered, that's odd. 
But one of the traditions that we as Americans have is New Year's resolutions. And if you and I, if we are any bit uh, part of our American culture, we will probably say one of the following. Lose weight. Yep. Manage debt, save money. Yep. Get a better job. I don't know. I don't know. For some. Get fit. Right up there. Gain muscle. Yes. Eat right. Gotcha. Yes. You know. Less chocolate, more carob. Um, I, yeah. Amen. See, I, I knew Mrs. McRoberts would love that one. Um, uh, get a better education. Yeah, that's true. Read more, right? Also listed, drink less, quit smoking. None of us say those here. Um, and if you do, you, you, you should drink less and quit smoking. <laughs> just, just saying it's better for you. <clears throat> Reduce stress overall. Take a trip. Volunteer to help others. And of course, within our spiritual context, we will always find spending more time with God as a New Year's resolution. However, if you are like me, in your 2013 highlight reel, you will find some clips that you wish were not really there. Because unfortunately, our memories sometimes do not work like a beautiful, clipped, edited ESPN clip, but as normal memory does, they include those sacks and pics that we just want to forget. Those things that would actually disappear. Oh, that they would be shredded with the calendar pages away. As the hype of the first somehow lasts into the first weekend of January, our resolution to fulfill our resolutions has the tendency of fizzing away like that open Martinelli's bottle that's in your fridge with which you toasted the New Year with. That's what happens with our New Year's resolutions sometimes. If you are like me. And I'm not talking to those of you who have the resolute ability and discipline to carry out with your resolutions all 365 days of the year. And there are some of you in this congregation, and I know you, and that is more power to you, not hating. But today, this is for those of us who lack that fortitude. For those of us who fizzle after the first week, first month, first quarter, oh, and it's over. Oh, I'll catch it next year. I'll catch it next year. Those of us who will focus on the stain rather than enjoying the pristine plush, plush carpet because a lot of times we will focus only on our mistakes in our highlight reel. Instead of focusing on the 51 touchdown passes, you focus on the three sacks. And you just go crazy over those negative things that you've done and you hate yourself for it. Those of us who will focus on the C flat that came out rather than the natural C will play the Beethoven sonata. You were playing a Beethoven sonata. Oh, oh, you played a flat, right? Okay, sure, it was horrible. Musicians understand that. Perfectionists understand that. Can I get a witness? There you go, okay. Those of us who will put an effort not on focusing on the good things, but on the bad. Because the resolutions a lot of times last very little, and many times the regret or the sense of failure becomes so encompassing for us that we just can't wait for the year to be over. And it's only January 2, guys. <laughs> However, I believe that tucked away in the midst of the Bible is a wonderful verse within a book full of proverbial wisdom. Proverbs 24, 16. <clears throat> it says from verse 15, Do not lie in wait, a wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place. And verse 16 speaks to us this morning, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. 
I like how the new English, the new English translation, the net translation puts it. It says, although a righteous person may fall seven times, he gets up again. Although a wicked, a, a righteous person falls seven times, he gets up again. I am often reminded of this reality, especially when it comes to stumbling. You see, the context of this is immediately saying, <clears throat> is tied to the calamities that the wicked desire to inflict on the righteous. It is, a con it, it is in the context of wanting to see the righteous fail, hating on the righteous, if you may. And yet, perhaps, it is not too much of a stretch to extract from these statements of truth the reality of what makes a man righteous. Now, we understand that righteousness is a gift from God, yes? It is a result of living a life of faith. As Habakkuk 2.4 says, the righteous shall live by faith. It is a gift. It is an empowering gift. And it has an effect, or at least that's what Scripture tells us, is that grace imparted, grace given, has an empowering effect on a person. An effect that is called righteousness that makes a person righteous. The righteousness given enables not a mindset of constant defeat, but rather a mindset of constant action, of standing up. Now the numeral seven is not literally a tally up list that explains how many times you can fall before you're done. It's not like the deauthorization of your iTunes um, uh, you know, devices once a year. Wow, that went over everybody's head. Bad example, techie guy. Um, it's not a thing that you have, okay, you count seven in a year and then you're done, you gotta wait for the next year. There you go, that was easier. Seven is, is, is more, aside from this, seven, seven always speaks of this perfection notion, of this notion of, of, of beyond just the number seven. It's the reason why when Peter says, Lord, should we forgive seven times? And Jesus says, no, no. <laughs> Seventy times seven, Peter. He's not saying that, oh, okay, so I need to tally up and forgive people 490 times the offenses they do. Because some of us would run out of those lists, especially in our marriages, real quick. We'd have to ask for renewal. <laughs> My wife can witness to that. She's gracious, though. <laughs> it speaks of a notion of whole. It is contrary to the imperfection of man, which is six. So it seems that this proverb is telling us a reality that exceeds our expectation about our own performance. It is telling us that grace enables a righteous person not just to withstand the attacks and snares of the wicked and that the wicked will lay at their feet, but that the righteous person has the capacity, the empowered ability, the knack to always get up, to never stay defeated. You always get up. The righteous person always gets up. They never stay on the ground wallowing in their stumbling or their defeat. They get up. Like the old Rocky movie. How many of you have seen Rocky? Rocky is right there, he's on the floor, and his old, old coach is telling him, what? Get up! Get up! Expletive, expletive, get up! You can almost see in the spiritual aspect of life, the one who empowers you and me saying, get up. The failure of a resolution that reminds us of our propensity to have a stalemate in the spiritual life, that is what gets to us. It is in the words of the song that asks a question that rings to us today, perhaps a lot more at the end of the year, and it states, what if I stumble? What if I fall? What if I lose myself and make fools of us all? Will the love continue when the walk becomes a crawl? What if I stumble? What if I fall? 
And the answer to that long, poignant question that we all ask ourselves in either bitter disappointment or the simple acceptance of a predictor failure comes from the pages of Proverbs. Seven times you fall, seven times you rise. Even when it's a crawl, even when the walk is an embarrassing army crawl through the mud, the resilience of grace is what must allow us to know that we must rise and rise and rise and rise again. Even when it's the failure to overcome a long-established bad habit that confronts us with the notion of grace. Be it workaholism or alcoholism or shopaholism, it's a holism. Be it the ill temper, rage, or the smugness over the rest. Be it Facebook, be it people or Playboy. Rise. 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 When another year goes by with yourself shackled to either the innocuous or the perverse, when you feel as a failure for stumbling with the same stone again and before we are drowned in the dissolution of a fate that ascribes to us failure as it is echoed in our minds daily by the enemy of our souls that relishes in the chance to accuse us and make us feel like garbage, I am encouraged by the fact that seven times you fall, seven times you rise. I am encouraged when I read in the midst of lamentations of Jeremiah that his mercies are new. How many mornings? Every morning. His mercy is renewed every moment, every morning, every year, every day. He is not just a high priest that is so removed from our suffering that he lacks empathy, but actually he is one who understands and empowers us to break the bonds that entrap, entangle, and drown. He is an all-empowering high priest. That is the reality of the power of grace, the reality of the righteous. Yes, you fall, but more importantly, you rise. We are in Christ, new creatures, renewed beings, all old things are gone. We are renewed. We are made whole because we rise and rise again. Because righteousness is the power of grace to save us from our sins. Seven times they fall, seven times they rise. That's the power of grace. So, what do we do with our resolutions this year? Well, I have some ideas of what we can do. First of all, my friends, don't go at it alone. Not a good idea. I know it's a very American thing to go at it alone because that's how we took the Wild West, right? We rode on our horse with our Winchester and we took on the Wild West. Yeah, well, the spiritual walk is not the Wild West. The Wild West is easy compared to the spiritual battle. Don't go at it alone. Find somebody that can help you. Find a partner, an accountability partner. I would recommend it not being your spouse. Some of you can probably do it. I know I wouldn't be able to withstand it. It's true. My wife has enough things to tell me to add some stuff that she doesn't need to tell me more. Find somebody you can trust. Somebody that loves you and you love back. Somebody that has been around for a long time. And that's the thing about trust and accountability. It has to be somebody that you are comfortable with and they are comfortable with you. They're not going to judge you. They're not going to spread your dirty little secret if it is a dirty little secret. 
Or if it's something innocuous, they're not going to judge you. They're not going to spread it. Not even with the excuse of, we need to pray for Brother Billy because he's still struggling with the you-know-what. No. It's somebody that will help you. Somebody that will walk with you. Somebody that will call you out when they need to call you out. Buddy, that loss of temper you had the other day at the fields, ooh, uncalled for, man. One-on-one, -on -one, you and me, now we can talk. I know you've asked me to, take, to, to help you with your temper problem. Well, let me tell you right now, flat out, as a friend and with love, you lost it, not cool. Don't go at it alone. But more importantly, instead of also, aside from finding a human companion, grasp the hand of grace. Grasp the hand of grace, of the empowering grace that lifts us up from our stumbles and our falls. Don't go at it alone. It's really crazy if you do. Good luck. Don't get complicated. You see, a lot of times we just fill up one day, we sit down and we think we're going to get everything done in our lives in one year. I have 34, oh my gosh, it's going to be 35 years. Ooh, now in March of bad habits. Some good ones. And I'm going to take care of them this year. All of them. <laughs> Laugh, it's laughable. Don't get complicated. Pick things that are doable. And pick things that you can measure. What you, in other ways, streamline your streamline, prioritize what it is that you really want to achieve. And then set a tangible goal. Instead of saying the over-encompassing, spend more time with God, I will have an hour devotion a day. I will have a 30-minute devotion a day. And mark it down. Don't get complicated. Because what's the other old proverb that's not in the Bible, but some think it should be? Too many hot irons in the fire. What happens with... Yeah, right? How's it go? Too many irons in the fire... Nobody? I've heard it from all you, from a couple of you like old timers, too many irons in the fire, Pastor Ed, just nothing gets done. Maybe they made it up. I don't know. If you're, if you're aiming for everything, you won't get anything done. Don't give up. Whatever you do, don't give up. You fall, you fall, you rise, you rise. Don't give up. You didn't, go to work, you, you didn't get your work on in today, well then get it in tomorrow. If you didn't get it in tomorrow, then get it on the next day, but don't give up. Don't stop the journey. Don't create a spiritual stalemate. You didn't do your devotional today, well do it tomorrow. You didn't catch it in the morning, catch it in the evening. Don't give up. Whatever you do, don't quit. You can't quit. The day you quit is the day you lose. As cliche as that sounds. You threw a pick, throw again. You miss a shot, shoot again. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't hate yourself when you fail once. When you fail for the thousandth time. Get up. The encouragement for that I find in Philippians 1 6, and I love how the Net Bible puts it. He says, For I am sure of this very thing that the one who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Let me repeat that because I. For I am sure of this very thing that the one who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. 
No, you got to do this louder. For I am sure of this very thing that the one who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you realize what this text is saying? The text is not just telling us don't give up. The text is telling us I am going to finish what I started with you. But we got to accept, which is number four. Give him permission. Give him consent. Because the gift is there, ready for you and I to just grasp it. Ready for you and I to just accept it. But if we don't accept it, the gift is powerless. That's the reality of grace. If you and I don't accept it, if we do not use it, if we don't put it into our lives, it's powerless. It's like fighting a war and having the most powerful weapon to finish and beat the enemy, but you're not using it. And it's not a nuclear dirty bomb. It's a clean, massive bomb, and you're not killing other humans. You're destroying demons. There. See? Makes it a lot better. But you're just not using it. Instead of using a rifle, you're still using your fists. <laughs> Accept it. Give him consent. Give him permission. And then don't give up. Keep it simple. And don't go at it alone. That's what this is about. That's what communion is about. It is, it is a reminder of the sacrifice that we celebrate this time of year that starts at the birth, that ends at the cross. <laughs> no, it doesn't end at the cross. It just continues at the cross. It will end when he comes. And maybe not even then. I would say it never ends. The gift will never end. But communion is about that. It is about that empowering aspect of grace. A grace that reminds you and me that we don't have to go at it alone. That we don't have to get complicated. That we don't have to give up. That we should give him consent. So today, as we celebrate the ordinances, my friends, as we go about right now and do the foot washing, which reminds us all that we're all at the same level at the cross. As we come back and participate of these ordinances, remember that the power to resolve your resolutions lies within the acceptance of the gift of grace, the empowering gift of grace. Let us participate then in foot washing and come back for the emblems.